Thank you so much for that beautiful song. I was listening behind that door and was moved to tears, uh, reflecting on what the message of that song uh, brought to our attention, the sacrifice of our Lord. Uh, before I start, I do want to encourage you to take this handout that was in your bulletin. Um, we're starting a brand new series. We have concluded our series on the Book of Romans. And uh, by God's providence, a more thorough and detailed study has picked up Sabbath afternoons led out by Elder John Tromley. So if you want to revisit the Book of Romans at more slow pace, uh, a lot more focused on each verse, he is leading out on a verse-by-verse -verse study throughout the whole book of Romans. Um, John, are you guys having studies today? Okay, so if you want more information, if you want to stay after the church service, uh, he'll provide the lessons for you. I want to encourage you to re review the book of Romans. It will be a tremendous uh, resource for you. It has certainly affected me. It, the series on the book of Romans has affected me personally, and it certainly has affected my ministry. Before I, want to, before I start with the sermon... Um, we have an event that we have now done for the past, I'm going to say, three years. Uh, we have taken advantage of the fact that a lot of people are open to the idea of coming to a church, any church, on Easter Sunday. And so as a church, we have opened our doors for an evangelistic effort. We've entitled it the Gospel Celebration. And uh, it's a very simple uh, service. We'll have some gospel songs, some praises, a message, and then some fellowship with refreshments. And we made it very concise because we don't want to overwhelm people, but we did it on Easter Sunday. Do you know when Easter Sunday is this year? April 1st. So it's not this Sunday, but the following one. And so I want to get ahead of this because you will see it announced next Sabbath in the bulletin. But I don't want you to just have one day notice to invite your friends and family, co-workers. Uh, I want this week to encourage you. Pray about your co-workers that don't go to church. Pray about your family members that are not Christian, not Adventist, not anything, and don't go to church. If there's one time of the year that people will be more open to going to church, you know what day of the year it is? Because that's something that is just kind of ingrained in our culture even. And so I'm wanting to take advantage of that ease of engagement so that we can hopefully win people for the Lord. And that these people that don't frequent church, that maybe only go during Easter Sunday, will begin to worship the Lord more frequently and above everything engage them with the Word of God. Will you pray, church, for me? I'm preparing my sermon for that Sunday. Please pray for your pastor. And pray for the people that are going to be involved with the music and the refreshments. And um, don't just think about your friends. I want to appeal that you also come. Your presence here will make a difference. Um, as we fill out the pews, it will be nice for other people to come and see people that want to hear God's word preached. So please uh, put it in your calendar. Don't ask yourself, well, if I have time, I'll come. You won't have time. Um, Satan will make sure that all of our time gets used up elsewhere. Please put it in your calendars and commit to be here to support the church. Um, if any, nobody that you invite comes, there will be people that will come. We've invested uh, social media advertisement. Uh, I want to thank Kiran and the rest of the worship committee for spearheading that. Um, we made a video, and I was looking at it last night, and the video that was created to invite people has been seen over 9,000 times already. At least one person will come, amen? So that one person needs to see people here, right? It would be, I'd be, it'd be painful to see one person <laughs> coming here because of social media and no one else. So please, I want to encourage you to be here. Um, and during the fellowship time, look for people you don't know, welcome them, be friendly, because we want people to be brought to a re personal relationship with Jesus. I know that that's how we reconnected with Frank. That's how we reconnected with Joyce. So um, reach out to your friends and families to come out uh, next, not this Sunday, but the following one. Let's pray as we begin this new series entitled Revival and Reformation. Father, I want to thank you for the way you have been answering prayers of the church, my personal prayers, 
I want to thank you, Father, for all the talent and the willingness that you have brought together here at Oakwood. Father, we want to confess to you that, yes, I was so happy to see the, the many views that our social media is getting. But your word warns us to lean on those things fully. It is not by might, it is not by power, but by your spirit. That's the only way we can ever make an impact in people's lives. So, Father, we, we do pray for this event for your spirit to bless it. We want to honor you by having this event to reach individuals that may never step foot in our church, may never want to come to hear about you. Please, during this week, through your providence, put people in our path that we will be able to invite to a day that it is not, it's not awkward, it's certainly not unusual. We ask, Father, that you please pour your spirit and bless what we're seeking to do. And in a special way, bless my mind and heart as we engage this new series on revival and reformation. Father, I pray that it will not just be a lecture, information. Heavenly Father, I ask that through the power of your Holy Spirit and your Holy Word, we can experience, all of us, what this message entails. For the glory of your name, I ask these blessings. In Jesus' name, amen, Lord. In 1934, an African-American Baptist pastor from Georgia made a trip of a lifetime. He sailed across the Atlantic Ocean through the gates of Gibraltar, which is right below Spain, above Morocco, across the Mediterranean Sea into the Holy Land. For an African-American Baptist pastor in 1934, this was a monumental, life-changing experience to visit the Holy Land. After this pilgrimage in the Holy Land, this Baptist pastor traveled to Berlin and attended an international conference for Baptist pastors. It was, while he was in Germany, this pastor, this Baptist pastor, who was named Michael King, became so impressed with what he learned about the reformer Martin Luther that he decided to do something dramatic. I'm reading verbatim from a book that I've been working through called Martin Luther, the Man Who Rediscovered God and Changed the World by Eric Metaxas. It's a recent publication. And this historian says that this Baptist pastor named Michael King became so impressed with what he learned about the reformer Martin Luther that he decided to do something dramatic. He offered the ultimate tribute to the man's memory by changing his own name from Michael King to Martin Luther King. His five-year-old son was also named Michael, and to the son's dying day, his closest relatives would still call him Mike. But not long after the boy's father changed his own, his own name, the father decided to change his son's names too, and Michael King Jr. became known to the world as Martin Luther King Jr. This father and son name change is just one dramatic measure of the influence of the German reformer Martin Luther. I thought, I thought this was a, I didn't know this, but I thought that this was a powerful segue from a month dedicated to highlighting and remembering our black history in our country to transitioning to a series on revival and reformation. The Protestant Reformation began with the German Catholic monk who, according to historian Eric Metaxas, this Catholic monk rediscovered God and changed the world. And centuries later, an African-American pastor was so impacted by the way the Reformation impacted this monk that it impacted this Baptist pastor so much that it changed his name and changed the name of his son. And we know how much of an impact the life of Martin Luther King Jr. has had in our country and the world. And it stems, the roots stem from the Protestant Reformation. We're going to begin a new series entitled uh, Rev Revival and Reformation, and I'm... I'm I, I almost didn't pick that title. Actually, I had picked a different title altogether because of the stigmas that those two words have. 
the misunderstanding, and I, I'll take ownership. I think a lot of times us pastors and evangelists have made those words to mean something that the Bible does not make them mean. Revival and reformation. Before there could be any Protestant reformation, there needed to be a revival in Luther's life. And before I can experience a reformation, which, I mean, the two words are almost foreign to us because we say them so much, they've lost their meaning. Revival means I was dead, but now I am alive. And reformation means that I was in this outward shape, but now I have been transformed to this other shape. I am reformed. I am reshaped. The outward transformation hinges upon the inner revival. I want us to look at this issue of revival and reformation and, and begin by saying this. Revival and reformation are not spiritual highs. They are not the byproduct of a week of prayer that stirs your heart. They are not the byproduct of a charismatic preacher or teacher. They are not the byproduct of a sermon even. Revival and reformation can only come from Jesus Christ. That's it. We can experience an emotional high, but that's all we get. Religion can, ex can provide just as much an emotional high as a casino can. Religion and church can provide just as much of a, what would be considered a spiritual revival, but it's nothing more than just emotions that have been stirred. Anything more than just what a movie can produce inside of you. But emotions moved by a movie or a film will not bring revival into your life. Any more than a speaker or a sermon will bring revival into your life. It is only Jesus Christ in your heart that can bring life to you and I. There's a book that I've recommended to you on many occasions. Aside from the scriptures, this is one of my top favorite books. I read it often. I go back to it frequently. And every time I do, there's fresh gems, spiritual gems. And as I began this research and study for Revival and Reformation several months ago, actually, uh, the, the Monroe Church are three sermons ahead of us. Um, I'm just starting out with you with what I've been starting three weeks ago with them. As I began to research and study this, I came across one sentence from the book Steps to Christ that changed the paradigm, my own personal understanding of revival and reformation. This is the, the sentence. It is um, the first quote in your handout. I want you to read it along with me. Step to Christ, that little book called, is page 59. It says this. There is no evidence of genuine repentance unless it works what, church? Reformation. So reformation is not something that we experience at camp meeting. Reformation is not something that you will experience if you listen to a, a, a moving sermon. And don't get me understanding. Isn't, there's nothing wrong with nourishing yourself with sermons. There's nothing wrong with wanting to hear the word of God preached. I enjoy hearing a good sermon. So there's nothing wrong with that. But you cannot expect reformation to come from listening to someone else's spiritual experience. Reformation, says here, can only stem from having had the experience of genuine repentance. Now, all of these words are very loaded and beautiful and significant. When the book was written, Steps to Christ, it could have simply said, there is no evidence of repentance unless it works reformation, but a clause was placed right before the word repentance and is genuine. Genuine repentance. And if there is such a thing as genuine repentance, that must mean that there must be also a false, a counterfeit. I lived most of my life in Pennsylvania, and when I used to work at a mall, my coworkers would plan, especially the ladies, would plan trips to New York. 
And I did not understand why, because they would go shopping for clothing in New York. Pennsylvania had no taxi, taxes on clothing. New York has taxes on the air you breathe. Everything over there is taxed. So I did not understand why in the world are you going to go buy in New York City clothing until I found out where they were going to go shopping. There is this place in New York City called Chinatown. Have you heard of it? People go to Chinatown not to eat Chinese food. Did you know that? There may be some Chinese restaurants there, but the reason people go to Chinatown in New York is because of Gucci and Louis Vuitton and uh, car uh, I'm trying to think of all the name brands that are out there that are above my budget. Uh, you know what I'm trying to say, right? Coach. You know, you know what Coach is? There are some boots that my wife likes that they were named after the sound of the husband that pays for them. These boots are called Ugg. That's the sound the husband makes when he pays for them. Ugg. Ugh. Oh, that's painful. You can get these there. $20. You can get Rolexes that had that Swiss smooth movement. $20. They're weighty and heavy, just like the real thing. Of course, a year later, they don't behave like the real thing. The purse, the coach purse that you saw that is identical to the coach purse that three blocks down cost $300. Here is $20. After a year, you see that the coach thing falls off all by itself. Because... It's only a matter of time before you can recognize the counterfeit from the genuine. And reformation hinges upon having what kind of repentance, church? What kind of repentance? Genuine repentance. This, please stop. If you are already gravitating towards, I gotta try harder at repenting. You trying hard to repent is the equivalent of me going to Chinatown and trying really hard to find a genuine coach in the midst of the counterfeits. Will I ever find a genuine coach in the midst of the counterfeits? The only place I can get a genuine coach is where, my friends? At the coach store. Where can you and I get genuine repentance? There's only one place. And it's Acts chapter 5, verses 30 and 31. It's in your handout. I want to ask that you please interact. I've, I've done some highlighting for you, some boldening and some underlining. But I want to encourage you to write stuff down. This sermon, I don't want it to be a lecture that you sit and go, Oh, that's nice. That's not how we experience revival and reformation. I want you to, to engage because the Holy Spirit, I prayed and asked, even on the way up here, I was rushing. I was asking the Holy Spirit to not make this just a lecture in which information gets disseminated. I want you to experience what I have been experiencing, a revival and reformation in my own personal life. I want to pass that blessing on to my church this morning. There's only one place where genuine repentance comes from. Acts 5, 30-31 says, The God of, this is Peter speaking to the church, to the, to the congregation, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered, by hanging it on a tree. Him, God has exalted to his right hand to be the prince and savior, and to give what, church? To give what? Who gives repentance? Jesus. Jesus gives repentance to Israel, and what else does he give? He gives forgiveness. You can no more be forgiven without Jesus than you cannot repent without Jesus. Genuine repentance will never be able to manufacture in the human heart of counterfeits. Your heart and my heart is Chinatown. You can only get genuine repentance from the only place where genuine repentance can come from, and that is from your Lord and your Savior, Jesus Christ. The salvation package of grace comes complete in Jesus. There's nothing you and I bring to the table of salvation. 
but we are tempted to. That's why in the book Steps to Christ, that word repentance is not simply listed without a qualifier. You see, we can experience sorrow because we lied in our taxes and now we're in jail. But I am not sorrowful that I got uh, caught up in sin and deception. I am sorrowing the fact that I am in jail, not that I cheated the government. Someone that has had an affair is not saddened that they have had an affair. They are saddened that they got caught. That's fake repentance. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll delete him from my phone or I'll unfriend my ex-girlfriend. I'll just have a second account that you don't know anything about. I'm going to learn from my mistakes. I'm going to do better so I don't get caught the next time. That's the best repentance we can do. Hide. That's what Adam and Eve did. Hide behind leaves. Trying to cover their nakedness with nothing. But with Jesus, with Jesus comes that which is crucial for us to experience revival and reformation. Repentance. Now, repentance for us is, well, what is repentance? Um, I have two verses there. The first one, I put because it says clearly that Jesus gives repentance. But some people, when I've shared this with them, says, well, pastor, it says gives repentance to Israel. That means he gives repentance to the Jews. I'm not a Jew. I'm a Gentile. There's no difference anymore after Jesus. If you go to Acts 11, 18, he says that to the Gentiles, he also grants repentance. I just put that there to quiet those of us that are very detail-oriented. Jesus gives repentance to Jews and Gentiles, which means that God wants to give you what you need to experience reformation. And I'm going to tell you right now, repentance is the same word as revival. Repentance is the same experience as revival. When we experience a, a, the, the issue of, re, of repentance, we have typically narrowed down the experience to, all right, I see that what I have done is wrong, and I'm going to stop doing that. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. See, all along the way of conversion, the, 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 the most dangerous, the most lethal enemy you have is your own mind, your own self. We sabotage everything God is trying to do to save us at every step of the way. And in this issue of repentance, it goes a little bit something like this. It usually goes like this in, in our experience. God finally gets us to recognize that what we have been doing is bad, is evil, it's a sin, and we acknowledge it. And then before Jesus could finish the sentence, we stop him and say, all right, Lord, I, I see it. I see, yeah, you're right, you're right. It was bad to cheat the government. All right, I'm not going to do that again. All right, I'm not going to do that again. And we think that that's repentance. That's not repentance. It's not repentance because you have just told Jesus you will never do that again, and that is a lie. And that's where I was for many years telling the Lord, I'm not going to do this sin again ever. I promise you, Lord, I promise I'm never going to do this again. And a week later, I was doing it, feeling frustrated and convinced that somehow maybe Christianity is a big hoax because it just doesn't work. I was thinking Christianity was like that coach back from Chinatown that the label falls off after a couple of years and that everybody in church was just faking it. The problem is not with God or the gospel. The problem is with us and us trying to put our spoon in the, in the mix and trying to help God save us. Listen, you will never feel sorry for the sins you committed. Never. Ever. So don't wait until you feel bad about what you've done and, and then come to Jesus. Repentance comes from him. And we need to come to the Lord with our hardened, stubborn, rebellious hearts and tell him, I'm not sorry for what I've done. This is the reality of what I feel. I know I should feel this way about these sins, but I don't, Lord. I feel totally comfortable with sin. That's the reality. I'm telling you, I'm not going to do it again, but in my heart, it will just be a matter of time before the opportunity shows up again and I'm back at it again. 
And there are many people that are not going through this process willingly being rebellious to the Lord. It actually hurts them to find themselves again in the things that they told the Lord, I'm not going to be doing this again ever again. I, I realize that my wrongs and I'm going to reform my life. I'm going to reform my life. There can be no outward reformation without genuine, what church? Repentance. And you and I obsess and invest so much spiritual, mental, emotional energy trying to change our outward behaviors, bypassing the only thing that will bring that genuine transformation. Genuine repentance that can only come from Jesus Christ. What is repentance? I put some, some quotes in here from the book Steps to Christ. That first quote under Acts 11.18 says, In dying for sinners, Christ manifested a love that is incomprehensible. And as the sinner beholds this love, it softens the heart, impresses the mind, and inspires what words are all in caps there, church? Do you know what contrition means? It means Repentance. I went to a dictionary and I put contrition uh, synonyms. First word, repentance. It is a paradox that when the Holy Spirit begins to work in our lives to bring revival and reformation, I realize how wrong I used to teach this process to people as a Bible worker. I used to tell people, it's like this. When God wants to show you how bad your sins are, it's like my grandma with our dog, Tommy, in Argentina. My grandma, my mom's dad, they had a house, and house structures are different in South America. They're not these hermetic, uh, uh, this, you know, weatherproof, windproof houses that we have here in the States. The houses that there are very much open, and there's a lot of open areas within the house, so you can have your pets in, in the house, but not be in the house. They're not in the bedroom or in the kitchen. And my grandma had a, a, a boxer named Tommy. Uh, mean, mean, mean look, but a heart of a teddy bear. And Tommy loved to play this game of bringing a rock to your foot. You kicked it, and he chased it. And his other full-time occupation was chasing my grandma's chickens all over the house. Sometimes, Tommy would forget that he needed to go to the bathroom in the backyard, way in the back. And sometimes he would get so caught up chasing chickens in front of the house that he would go into to the bathroom in the hallway. I know that there's some, you know, PETA people that, you know, may protest my grandma's doing this, but this was the culture. This is how in Argentina we solved the problem of dogs poo-pooing in parts that they shouldn't have. My grandma... My dad tells me this. Tommy was young. I never saw him do this because they fixed the problem when he was a teenager, so to speak. My, my dad tells me that my grandma grabbed Tommy by the collar and dragged him to where his poo-poo was. And, of course, Tommy kind of got her to get a feeling of, uh, where are we going? I don't want to go in that direction. That's where I have just gone to the bathroom. It stinks over there. I don't want to go there. And that's exactly where my grandma is taking him, by the collar, and the closer they get, the more Tommy is digging his heels. And you can hear his tile floor. All this, his nails are not able to get any traction. And then when the grandma, grandma got Tommy in front of his feces, kind of like people do with birthday cakes, never pooped there again. And I used to tell people, that's how God will bring repentance to you. And I was wrong. I was wrong. The scriptures doesn't teach that Jesus take you and me and shoves our mistakes and our errors in our face. The only way you and I can begin to experience spiritual revival is when we take time, listen carefully, when we take time to do what is, to behold Christ, to begin to look at the life of Jesus, to behold this love. When I see Jesus, seeing Jesus softens my heart, impresses my mind, and inspires repentance. I'm going to read the next quote. 
But whenever they make an effort to reform from a sincere desire to do right, it is the power of Christ that is drawing them. An influence of which they are unconscious works upon the soul. And what, church? What comes alive? The conscience, it's an old English word, is quickened. Just means revived. The conscience is revived and the outward life is amended. That means repentance. It means reformed. And as Christ draws them to look upon his cross, to behold him whom their sins have pierced, the commandment comes home to the conscience. The wickedness of their life, the deep-seated sin of the soul is revealed to them. They begin to comprehend something of the righteousness of Christ. God doesn't take you to the messes of our life to lead you to repentance. God takes you to the cross of his son, Jesus. That's where we see the reality of our sins. I had it backwards. I thought you need to go and revisit all your past, feel really bad about what you've done, and then go to Jesus when you feel bad. And now it makes sense why me teaching these things to young people in Columbus, Ohio, they never changed I would study with them for a year, and for a year they were still having sex with their boyfriend. They were still having sex with their girlfriend. They were still not attending church. They were still falling in the same sins month after month, week after week. And I take fault for not telling them where true, genuine repentance would have come into their lives so that they would have experienced a transformation, a reformation of their lives. Why you and I sometimes get into these spinning the wheels, ruts, plateaus of our spiritual lives, those are evidences that our eyes are becoming blurry to who Jesus is and that the cross is beginning to lose its power in our hearts. You know, this past January we had a it's called Ministerial Retreat. It's when all the pastors, we go up to Campo Sabo for visitors and new members. We go up to Campo Sabo. It's a camp that the church owns up north. It's a beautiful area. We'll actually be there in May for church retreat. So I would encourage you to take time of your vacation to, take, uh, to be up there for the church retreat. It's an awesome experience. Gail can give you more information about that. All of us pastors were up there, and the conference brought this gentleman by the name of Ron Duffield. He's not a pastor. He's a respiratory therapist from Washington State. But this respiratory therapist experienced a revival in his life several years ago because he began to realize that his life was not experiencing the reformation he knew he should. And Satan knows that as long as we don't have that experience of genuine repentance, our lives will never reform. And He'll put us on a catch-22. He'll think what you need is to have more information. But having more information with an unrenewed heart is torture. All you're doing is learning how really high the standard is. And you thought, well, man, I have a hard time reaching this standard. No, the standard now is up to here. And so you become even more discouraged with more information. And Satan knows that. And he knows that the more information that he gives to you about what the standards of holiness and righteousness is, he wants to discourage you so much so that you will just give up. So many people leave the church wanting to be Christians. And they think that what they lack is information. So, Brother Duffield, all he talked to us pastors for three days was about Jesus and his righteousness. He doesn't speak like me. He was not charismatic. He did not raise his voice. He was calm and steady. On the third day, he made a simple appeal to the pastors. All the Michigan pastors, all of us, began to weep in repentance. 
because we had seen Jesus. It was genuine repentance. And we began to confess our own lukewarmness, our own attachments that keep us from being used by the Lord the way he wants us to be used. That was in January. All of us came home burdened. I don't want to lose this experience. The pastors of this district, there's 12, church, 12 churches. All of the pastors, when we had our district meeting the month following, we looked at each other and said, we're going to lose this experience unless we change something. We can't continue doing the same things expecting different results. That is called crazy. What are we going to do? That meeting, we prayed and we realized us, all, all the pastors of District 12, we are now not just meeting once a month to talk about the business and planning of the churches. We are meeting once a week to pray for one hour and to study Jesus for one hour as pastors. I've never experienced that. It's affecting me. I'm being honest in that I had my moments of lucidations in which I would see Jesus and I experienced tremendous changes in my life, but it was not consistent. Some things would change and I, would thought, I thought, okay, that's taken care of, I can move on. But I've come to realize that revival and reformation, far from being a sporadic emotional experience that happens at camp meeting when we hear a, a, a powerful speaker, there's nothing wrong with those experiences, but that's not revival and reformation. I've come to realize that revival and reformation really is the continual conversion of my soul to fall in love with Jesus. Because I am attaching myself more and more to the source of life. How can I experience a revival outside of the life giver? It is not a sermon, it is not a preacher, and it is not a church. It is Jesus Christ in your life. And we recognized... We recognized that the things that were not changing in our lives is because there were areas of our life in which Jesus had no access to. And the areas of your life that you want so bad to change and they don't change is because Jesus has not been allowed to enter those areas of your life. And the reason we don't is because we have not seen him at the cross. There's a reason why this book points us to the cross. It's not simply that we go, oh, he suffered so much for us. No. Repentance that comes from going to the cross of Christ has that element of recognizing what our sins have done to him, but it also has a, a consequence of seeing what we have done to ourselves, who we are really for real. At the cross, there is no room to hide. At the cross, there is no place where I can bring excuses and reasons as to why I should not, why I cannot surrender, give up, walk away. You see, when we did the, our series on Romans and we spent an entire sermon defining sin, we came to this conclusion you have been affected by sin in such a powerful way. The reality of your spiritual indifference is that you don't have a clue who God is. You and I do not know God, and worse, we cannot know him. Anything and everything God does to us, we misinterpret and misconstrue. Because we don't know him, we don't trust him. And because we don't trust him, we don't love him. And because we don't love him, we don't obey him. That's the gospel sequence. But we want to start with the obedience, the final step. And skipping all of these other processes that are part of the experience Jesus wants you to have with him. At the cross, for me it's like the cross is many things, but one of those things is the equivalent of the manger. At the manger, humanity came 
face to face with the deity, face to face with God. And if there's something that's going to bring down your guard, if there's something that you're going to realize this is innocent, this is harmless, it's a baby. Who could be a ter- terrified of a baby, right? Who could be terrified of a, of a baby? And God came that way to bring our guard down as to who he is to us. For millennia, God, humanity, even God's people, were convinced God was just ready to fire up the fires of hell and destroy them. Even though, repeatedly through prophets, God would say to them, how can I give you up? I love you with an everlasting love. I am calling you, please repent. I am sending you prophets that you stone and kill, so I'm sending you more prophets. You don't trust me. Look at the sacrifices. Look at what I'm asking you to interact with, a lamb. That's me. I will never, ever harm you. Let your guard down. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be like wool. Though they be red like crimson, I will make them white. The gospel begins with God relating to us in a real sense. God knows we are terrified of him. God knows we are terrified of him because we don't know him. And at the cross, we see what, how God reacted when we spit on his face, when we pulled at his beard, when we punched his face, when we crowned him with thorns, when we hit those crown of thorns, when we blasphemed against him, when we cursed at him, when we derided him, when we rejected him, when we treated God thus, God responded with, Father, forgive them. When we hurt God, God did not hurt us back. And at the cross, Our guards go down. And we are willing, we are made willing to hear God out. And what God says and what God does at the cross of Christ begins to affect you and I deeply. You know, repentance is a gift. And this last quote, it says, Ask God to give you repentance. And look at the very next statement. How is God going to give you repentance? To reveal who to you? Christ. God will not give you repentance by shaming you or exposing your sins. You know, when Mary Magdalene was brought before Jesus, saying this woman was caught in adultery in the very act, that's how we try to bring repentance to other people, shaming them and exposing them. You know how Jesus responded to that scenario? He looked around at the people and he saw the sham. He saw the sham. You you know the story. He began to write on the ground. And you know what he wrote on the ground? The sins of everybody that was there. But you know what he did not write? Their names. He wrote the sins because he didn't want The shame, the shame is already there. Sin brings shame by default. What Jesus was seeking to do was to soften and let the guard down. I mean, he said, I know you. I know all of you. If you are without sin, throw the first stone. Jesus knew no one would dare to throw one, not after reading his list. But he didn't want people to focus on the list. He wanted them to focus on him. The sad thing is, the heartbreaking part is this. Jesus was setting them up to save them at that moment. As they realized, I can't throw a a stone. I have sinned. Jesus was ready not just to forgive Mary Magdalene, but to offer forgiveness to all of those wicked, horrible, dark people. But you know what they did? They dropped the stones and left the presence of Christ. The only one that was left was the only one that received salvation. Where are those that condemn you? No one, Lord? 
I don't condemn you either. I came to pay for your sins. You don't have to be afraid of me. You don't have to be afraid of your Savior. There's a reason why one of the names he appropriates is the Lamb of God. Jesus will never, ever harm you. Ever. Jesus, he will never, ever shame you. He died in your shame. He died to heal our shame. God will never do anything to damage or hurt you. In fact, when we begin to understand the gospel, the reason repentance takes place is that it's not just that we begin to realize God will never hurt me, but through this revelation of God, I will begin to see that the hurts and the wounds that I've experienced have been at the expense of sin, not God. And I will begin to develop a hatred for that which brings death to me. The wages of sin is death. And we love sin. You will love sin until the day you look at Jesus and begin to fall in love with him. You may love the church, you may love people here, you may love the pastor, you may love the pew, you may love the music, you may love the whatever in this church, but if you do not love Jesus, you will never be saved. Salvation doesn't come by humans. I share this. As I was meditating over the sermon, I, I thought about Peter and Judas Iscariot. The same night, Peter denies Jesus how many times, church? And the words were painful. The words were painful. The words define, I have no relationship with him. I have no, no commitment. There's nothing between me and him. I don't know the man. I don't know the man. And in the last one, I don't know the man with a lot of swearing. That same night, Judas receives money to betray Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that same night, Peter and Judas are crying. They're weeping about what they have done. It has dawned on them what has happened to them. Peter follows Jesus at a distance, and Peter sees Jesus looking at him. And the Gospel of Luke says that when the Lord looked at Peter, Peter went away and wept bitterly. Because he was experiencing for the first time genuine repentance. Judas Iscariot took the money and threw them at human beings' feet. And you know what those human beings, the priests of God, said to them? What is that to us? That's your problem. You solved your own mess. Because Judas never went to Jesus, he never received repentance. That's why he destroyed himself. Peter went to Jesus, and his conscience was revived. He saw what he had done to the one that had never harmed him. He saw what he did to Jesus, who was loyal to him. He saw he had betrayed one that deserved his unreserved loyalty, and he wept bitterly. From his conscience being made alive, Peter's life was reformed because he went to Jesus. You will not get repentance from your parents. You will not get repentance from me. You will not get repentance from religion. You can only have your life revived and reformed when you choose to go to Jesus, and it has to be personal. I'm appealing to you a very simple appeal. As simple as it is, if done in faith, it will yield the results that you're seeking for. I know this. All of us here this morning 
want to be Christians. Amen? I am almost sure many of us are finding ourselves falling short in some area of our lives. Some part of me is not where it ought to be. God's Word is letting you know you have left your first love and you're being invited to seek for Jesus in your life. Which means, this afternoon, what have been your habits? Sunday mornings, what have been your habits? Weekdays, with the busyness and the craziness of life, what have been your habits? If you are not willing to change the habit of where you go, you will reap what you sow. Judas went to humans, and from humans got nothing. Peter went to Jesus and got eternal life. Where will you go this afternoon? Where will you go tomorrow? Where will you go Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday? Revival and reformation happens on a daily basis. They need to happen on a daily basis. And they happen when you look for a quiet place. Listen carefully. When you look for a quiet place and pray, Father, reveal your son Jesus to me. Could you please show me your son? The pastor says we need to do this. And then as I do this, you will reveal your son Jesus to me. And when you see, when you, I see Jesus you re, as you reveal him to me, he will change me. He will give me the repentance that I need. And through that repentance, that genuine repentance, a reformation in my life. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to take time with Jesus? Are you willing to open the Word of God and begin to read about your Savior? Pick Matthew, pick Luke, Mark, or John. Pick one of those, but pick a gospel and begin to read it, seeking to see Jesus. Because as you see Him, He will gift you with the greatest need you and I have, revival and reformation. Father in heaven, through my clumsiness and imperfections and deficiencies, I want to praise you. I want to give glory to you, Lord. Because through the foolishness of preaching, I know that you have spoken to hearts this morning. You have appealed tenderly. Your Holy Spirit has revived the conscience of my brothers and sisters. Father in heaven, Forgive our lukewarmness. Forgive the apathy in which we approach our prayer life. Forgive the uncommitted ways we relate to your holy word. Father, we are where we are because of the choices of not simply not trying to be better Christians, but we are not connected to you through Jesus. We have not seen glimpses of him in our lives. And Father, I know I've had these experiences in the past, but I don't want to have them once a year because someone lifting up Jesus before me. I want to see Jesus every day. And I know my friends this morning who are listening, they want to see your son Jesus every single day more and more clearly. Lift up your son, Father, before my church. Reveal your son Jesus Christ to my brothers and sisters. Father, I am asking according to your will. So I am thanking you because you will. If we seek, we will find. That's your promise. I close with this prayer. Father, spur us to seek. Convict us to seek. Convict us to open your word and pray, show me Jesus. In his name, amen.